since I'm a medical doctor, I'm responsible to disclose to you Procopius, uh, which I'm responsible to disclose, disclose to you my uh, um, activities. I'm a paid consultant for Abbott Nutrition, Biogen, and Lily. My Greek name is Iraklis. My parents did not think I would survive school in the United States with the name of Hercules. And Eleni reminded me that the club that Hercules carries is made of olive wood. In the United States, we have over 5 million people with Alzheimer's disease. It's a population of 370 million. The same calculations would apply to Greece, to Spain, to all of Europe, because your populations are aging almost as quickly as those in North America. And the large portion of, of patients that have disease um, still are, aren't well qualified and well described. I like to say that if you live to age 85, you have an 85% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease before you die. The disease begins far sooner than what we clinically manifest. And we think that people probably develop disease 10 to 15 years before Yaya and Papu start to display problems. And there are many uh, compensatory mechanisms in the brain that protect us as the disease of plaques, tangles, and neurons uh, accumulate. And this is one of the reasons why we believe that uh, keeping people at home, keeping them functionally uh, able to do what they want to do, and then not pushing them into transitions, situations where they're uncomfortable, where they can't use stored up memory and habits um, to keep them out of trouble is important. This is one of the reasons when I counsel families, I tell them there will come a time when your parents do not want to travel, should not want to travel, and you should not be moving them around because they won't be able to adjust. This is also one of the reasons why hospitalizations are so tragic for the elderly. They never recover from the hospitalization fully. The natural history and progression of the disease is something like this based on a scale that is a memory scale. At the beginning, cognitive symptoms occur, the diagnosis occurs at some point in time. As the disease progresses, we lose function. We lose the ability to handle our finances, to actually maintain a household. And usually only very late in the disease do we see people with experiences of behaviors and difficulties. If we have any interventions at all that work with drug therapy, they have to occur early where the signal is strongest with cognition because by the time you get down into this area, those drugs have absolutely no benefit. We like to think about the disease of dementia as a spectrum, but in truth, most of our patients who have disease actually have Alzheimer's disease. If you're going to make a guess at what the problem is, that's the best guess you can make. There are a lot of patients that have a vascular component to their Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there are a number of patients who have very peculiar dementing illnesses that are genetically determined. Those people tend to have these problems that we refer to as tauopathies. They have another condition known as frontotemporal dementia. The behavioral manifestations are clearly more obvious early on. And this population is much younger. You certainly can inherit the disease from your parents, but more likely than not, you're going to inherit their longevity that puts you at the greatest risk when you get to age 80 or 85. The pathologic sequence, and I think you're going to see this in our next speaker's slides as well, is usually the accumulation of what we call beta amyloid. And that's where the inflammatory piece, that's where the a piece with uh, olecanthal comes in. 
um, microglial activation the same, that's an inflammatory process. Then by the time we get to the destruction of cells, the inflammatory piece is long gone. This is when we start to manifest the clinical problems of disease. And here we have a normal brain on this side compared to an abnormal brain on the other side. We also have some studies that would suggest fairly strongly that exercise improves some of the structures in the brain that are actually most actively involved with incorporating new memory. The hypothesis that we've been working on for the past 20 years now and have probably invested over $8 billion on is this amyloid hypothesis. And again, this is where the inflammatory part of Alzheimer's disease comes into play because we have been using over the last 15 years a number of different antibodies, especially in these areas of the brain where we try to prevent the aggregation of this amyloid or, as I'm going to show you, where we actually reduce the amyloid burden in an attempt to reverse the disease. So we have part of the inflammatory process going on here and another inflammatory piece here as these telepathies and neuronal loss all play in to the changes that occur within the brain. And again, well, in, uh, well before clinical manifestations of disease. With early amyloid and early Alzheimer's disease, we have the accumulation of amyloid here, as we've seen, with the toxicity that's involved. And then as the disease progresses and the cells themselves start to collapse, we have these changes in levels of tau, and we see more tau develop as the neurofibrillary tangles also develop. Our greatest progress in Alzheimer's disease has not been in prevention, and it's not been in drug therapy, but it's been in defining biomarkers, those causative agents that we can predictably say are going to lead to disease at some point in time. And over the past 20 plus years, we've been able to identify many of the genetic markers. We've been able to look at spinal fluid and that amyloid. I'm going to show you one slide that has uh, positron uh, emission tomography scanning with amyloid that shows the accumulation in the brain. We can also show that tau protein and the inflammatory cytokines change in the cerebral spinal fluid. Then we've got MRI scans. And clinically, we've got tests that we can do. Some of them take up to three to four hours in our language and culture specific to help us really understand what loss a patient has. Jose quipped very early on that many of us, and I taught him this, many of us forget names. You can forget names and still have a free pass. There is no correlation between forgetting someone name and having Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you forget, ah, now, if you forget to pick up your wife at the beauty shop, that's another story. <laughs> So here we have uh, just a couple of examples. This is the cerebral spinal fluid of people with dementia, people who we help define in that middle group of mild cognitive impairment, and that's actually where my research has been. And in the volunteers that we helped to, uh, that I uh, in enrolled in, in our studies. And we know that over time, CSFA beta changes uh, significantly from um, high levels in normal individuals to very low levels in Alzheimer's patients because it goes into the brain. And we know that just the opposite occurs with tau. There's very low levels of tau in normal individuals, and as cells get destroyed, there are more higher levels of tau in the cerebral spinal fluid. And these, again, are predictors for us as well as we look at disease and progression of disease. Again, we can now do scans of the brain that measure uh, amyloid, and this is the first compound for amyloid. 
and we can see that a normal control here looks quite different from the activation of the amyloid in the brain here and here. So there are significant clinical findings already available to us to look at the disease. Unfortunately, the drug therapy hasn't kept up. This is the one saving drug from that $8 billion investment. Last year at the international conference, it was reported that acanumab uh, had um, a positive signal. And that, I gave you the disclosure with Biogen. I'm working with Biogen on thinking about the next step of this drug when it comes to market, because it's finally shown some uh, positive effects in what we call fibrillary amyloid in the brain and in removing that amyloid from the brain. Not only can it remove the amyloid from the brain, but this is the first drug that seems to have a positive effect on cognition so that you actually get better when you're on the drug. So again, it targets the aggregated forms of amyloid and we can clearly see in the brain that we've removed amyloid and then we can do those clinical studies that show that there's a positive endpoint, and this is the first. So $7.9 billion investment goes in at the $8 billion mark. We finally have a signal for this, because this whole line of thinking was just about to be abandoned, almost completely abandoned. Now, there are several different mechanisms that been, have been elucidated with regard to the inflammatory attack that goes on with Alzheimer's disease pathology. This is an older study from 1996 that talks about C1Q accelerating the aggregation of A-beta amyloid. And we certainly know that A-beta amyloid is present in brains. A-beta stimulates cytokine production as well, which may stimulate A-beta precursor protein production. So it's a, it's a nasty cascade. A-beta deposition head trauma aging also stimulate inflammation, which cause further degeneration which cause further inflammation. The inflammation clearly occurs uh, in vulnerable areas of the brain and the brains that incorporate, the parts of the brain that incorporate new memory, especially the hippocampus. And that's the part of the brain that I told you, if you exercise, you actually can make it more robust. It actually gets bigger on scans. And in the periphery, degenerating tissues and the deposition of insoluble abnormal materials also stimulate inflammation. And we've had plenty of talks about olive oil and inflammatory processes. These are the links to Alzheimer's disease, which again is one of the most common diseases of the elderly and clearly the scourge of the elderly. This is from that same paper, um, brain damaged neurons and neurites in insoluble beta amyloid depositions uh, sti uh, stimulate uh, further inflammation. So it's a very nasty <laughs> circulatory cycle. And the postulates that we came up with in 2000 continue to be elucidated at this time. Over many years, direct and bystander damage from the inflammation exacerbates the pathologic process, and by better understanding inflammation and um, uh, regulating it, it's possible to develop the anti-inflammatory approaches like the drug therapy, the immunotherapy uh, with the beta amyloid therapies that I've shared with you already, but that's not to say that's the limit of where we should go with this. This is a um, update, 2015 update, continuing to talk about further evidence suggesting that the Alzheimer's disease process is not restricted to just the neuronal compartment, but there's a lot of other immunologic mechanisms in the brain at play. And it really has been in the last 15 years that we've come up with a better understanding of the immunology of cellular mediated activities. Misfolding aggregate proteins binding in other ways on the glia, on the cells of the of the brain itself um, are an immune response in and of themselves, further triggering inflammatory mediators which to contribute to disease progression. We've done a genome analyses suggesting that there are a number of genes, some of them uh, um, dominant genes, 
that encode factors that regulate this inflammatory process. And very likely some of the tauopathies, these familial uh, genetically determined uh, diseases are related to this inflammatory process. There's also external factors, um, including o inflammation, obesity, uh, that, that, that lead to progression. Although I will again state that age in and of itself is the biggest risk factor. More than your family history, age is the risk factor. Um, a modulation of these risk factors and targeting of the immune system could lead to further therapeutic interventions. This comes out of that Lancet article just this past year of this beta amyloid deposition affecting it here, looking at the modulators here that cause disease, and again, thinking that the timeline really goes out 20 years plus. So most of us in the audience are already experiencing something that's not right, that may in fact lead to disease 20 years down the line. We often get asked, and I actually put on three conferences for the Alzheimer's Association that were about prevention. We did this um, every other year for six years, and all we could really come up with, and still come up with, is that the preventive strategies are all related to vascular risk, all vascular risk. So you need to lower cholesterol, you need to try to lower homocysteine, lower high blood pressure, control diabetes, exercise regularly, engage in socially and intellectually stimulating activities. And that should be a theme that we've heard today and yesterday with regard to the Mediterranean diet as well. There is a vascular component to Alzheimer's disease different from vascular dementia. So again, looking at trying to do something about Alzheimer's disease still gives you the opportunity to treat the vascular and inflammatory components of that disease itself. Improving someone's blood pressure improving someone's cardiovascular fitness will help their Alzheimer's disease. And this was a worldwide uh, study uh, defining the different types of dementia and where they occur in different countries. Again, the take home message is all developed countries have an aging population. The aging population is highly at risk for Alzheimer's disease. We can also look at vascular cognitive impairment and look at the elements that put this together. This came from that same paper. And again, all of those uh, pieces that conspire to brain health can be on either one side or the other side. And again, once, once more, we have the um, brain reserve, we have the activities of neurotoxicity, and then we have um, other quantitative effects that help us here or hurt us here with neuroinflammation and the like. So it's a balancing act trying to um, uh, take care of our vascular health um, as it relates to Alzheimer's disease and perhaps as it relates to um, um, our olive oil discussions. The Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay came out just a couple years ago. It was put together by a group at the uh, Rush University in Chicago funded by the National Institute on Aging, published online in February 2015. The team followed food intake of uh, nearly 1,000 seniors for four and a half years. Not surprisingly, 144 participants developed Alzheimer's disease over the course of the disease. Um, but the longer that people were on this particular Mediterranean diet, um, the less risk they appeared to have to develop Alzheimer's disease. Again, a strong little study, 950 people, uh, who made modest changes in their diet actually felt better. Um, now, even those that wouldn't fit the criteria for DASH or Mediterranean still did better. And this study found that the MIND diet lowered Alzheimer's risk by about 35% for people who followed it moderately well and up to 53% for people who adhered to it rigorously. Mayo Clinic has published um, a lot on the Mediterranean diet uh, when you get, uh, and Alzheimer's disease. And when you get into the details, uh, you've seen pretty much the details that I've given you. It doesn't get 
uh, to the level of confidence that we'd still like to have it. What I want to point out as I conclude right now is that we've talked about the Mediterranean diet, fruits, vegetables, fish, limit to unhealthy fats, olive oil, nuts, and a glass of wine. Um, with Alzheimer's disease, we talk about self-actualization. You saw that in some of my previous slides. You saw me or heard me talk about it with regard to family and, and the social interactions. You heard about it in some of the very early discussions we had about blue zones, those healthy aging populations that are 100 years old. And for the most part, those populations are socially and individually engaged. Keeping that family unit together, keeping that group of people together is important. And we in the United States do a very bad job at the present time of thinking about slow meals. It's a trend that's coming back. But sitting around with family and friends, having the meal, it's actually a big part of general health and well-being and a big part of the Mediterranean diet. And we have put it into our newsletter to talk about those benefits. So Yaya and Papu would say, Ella Ella Pedakimu, it's time to eat. And here I am waiting on my Spanish friends to join me for a lovely meal that's complete with olive oil, waiting for us to joy, enjoy a social activity. So, Fkaristo.